Um, today, uh, we're able to celebrate so many good things. We have beautiful weather. Uh, we have the refreshing wind around us, um, a sign of God's blessing with us. We also have a reminder of God's faithfulness through decades past in Pastor Sam Laswell and um, Judy uh, Laswell joining us in worship. Uh, we'll be looking forward to hearing a brief testimony from them um, after our time of praise. And I think that sometimes um, it's a small thing like that to see a familiar face that we haven't seen uh, for many years that reminds us of how much God has done in between now and the time that we saw them last. And I'm sure all of you thinking back to 2010 uh, can see many signs of God's faithfulness. Uh, thinking about that, uh, would you join me in prayer as we open our worship? Dear God, we thank you because we are here and our presence here is a sign of your faithfulness. It is proof of your love. Dear God, we thank you because the relationships around us, it's proof that you are working in us, encouraging us to forgive each other, learn from each other and bless one another despite all of our imperfections. God, we thank you because our presence here together as a community means that you have watched over our health, you have watched over our finances, you have led us through many confusing twists and turns so that we can continue to worship you. God, as we think towards the future, as we think to 2030 and other years ahead of us, help us to be confident because you who created this day and you who bless us this day will continue to lead us ever onward. Thinking of your faithfulness, may we be confident no matter what lies ahead. These things we pray in Christ's name. Uh, today we're going to be going right into communion. Um, at your seats or as you came in, you'll see the communion packets um, that are nice and sanitarily prepared. Um, there's two tabs. The top tab opens the wafer and then the bottom tab below it opens the juice. Um, let's um, open the top tab first. Just take the bread out. I practiced before, but the one I have is hard. The, um, the plastic is. The night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat this bread, do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup and he poured wine into it and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this cup, you proclaim my death and resurrection until I come again. At this time, let's take the bread together and let's ask God prayerfully, God, would you supply to me all that I need to glorify you and to serve you in this life? Let's take the bread together. And again, let's take the cup. Considering the sins that we need forgiveness from, let's drink the cup together and then let us pray together. Church, let us pray. God, we come to you and we declare that when we feel weak, those are the times that we think, perhaps I don't have enough strength to serve Jesus. And we think about going far away from him. God, we thank you for today's reminder that Jesus is our strength. And when we are weak, it is his presence that we need most of all. God, in the same way, there are times when we feel guilty. And because of our guilt, we think, I can't go to Jesus right now. But we thank you that through communion, you remind us that Jesus is who we need when we are guilty, for it is by his blood that we are made forgiven and whole. So as people who have received from Jesus grace sufficient for today, help us to have a mindset of declaring your great faithfulness and help us to stand and praise you with confidence and joy. These things we pray in Christ's name. 
Amen. At this time, we're going to be going into a time of praise, but there will be ushers coming around to pick up the trash. Um, as you discard your trash, please stand and join in worship as Josh leads us. Everybody, Good morning. It's good to worship with you again. Yes, I will. 
Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will. Count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out, working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy on my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will I choose to praise To glorify, glorify The name of all names And nothing can stand against I choose to praise To glorify, glorify The name of all names Nothing can stand against so Yes, I will Yes, I will Lift you high In the lowest valley Yes, I will Bless your name Oh, yes, I will Sing for joy When my heart is heavy All my days Oh, yes, I will Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will. Yes, I will. Amen. Let's pass the peace of Christ to one another. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let's give God the glory as we welcome Pastor Sam Laswell and Judy, who were with New Hope Church 12 years ago when it became first a congregation. That word is important, and some of you are here on my first Sunday, you will know, or maybe you will remember, I tried to say that word and murdered it badly. Um, as my first Korean word to a Korean congregation or a mixed congregation and we're so glad to be back and I was just reminiscing a few moments ago it's hard not to when you're among a situ in an event like this and um, I felt tears coming not of sadness but of joy and of remembrance and that's one of God's chief commands to all of us is to remember it. On communion tables, those words, do this in remembrance of me, is on the front of most of them that I've ever seen. And um, it's an appropriate time right now to remember. I've got a couple more things to say. Um, not going to take longer than an hour, I'm sure. I promised Pastor Sam I wouldn't. But uh, this church, this church, um, you folks, you wonderful people, helped us learn a lot of things like how to eat sushi, uh, bibimbap and bulgogi, 
some of our favorite still Korean foods, although there were some that we saw in some of the banquets that we did not have the courage to try. But that one was, those were a few that we did. And I always will remember with fondness having a cup of warm barley tea in the pulpit when I was up there to uh, preach. And that was, uh, I'll never forget that. Judy has a couple things I think she wants to say and then I'll finish up. This is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. What a beautiful day and to be with you beautiful people. Uh, we see some familiar faces. We see some, or we miss some too. Uh, life has changed, ready or not, but God is in charge. And uh, Pastor Sam uh, uh, handed this booklet to us this morning when we got here. And I was just leafing through on page 16. It says, um, with chaos and calamity all around, the Lord continues to speak words of warning, judgment, and comfort, not only to his people, but also to the nations. And then it continues on about Jeremiah and, you know, how much we can learn from Jeremiah and, and uh, be directed. So we, we just always thank you for the privilege of being here with you. It was uh, a real pleasure. And uh, it took us a long time to learn to say Anyang Haseo. <laughs> During my time of ministry here, uh, it was more like, a joyful vacation in many ways instead of a job or a duty to have to do. There was a lot of important things that I had to help the church with, like getting making the transition from being the KPCMD English ministry to an, a brief moment of Presbytery's time when they voted to affirm your, your petition to be an independent church. And my title changed from being one thing to being another in just an instant. And you became not just an English ministry in your parents' church, but to be a church in your own right. And uh, there, were, there was a lot of happy moments and happy feelings at that time. And uh, I, I still remember them fondly. I, uh, we brought our scrapbook around, which is in a two inch binder. So in a year and a half, I accumulated enough to fill a two inch binder of things that we wanted to remember about you. And one of the things I was looking at was a picture of a large group of uh, New Hope Church members with all their little children in front. All the children are now teenagers. I, I imagine as a young lady right here might have been in that picture <laughs> as, a tod as, a, as a young kid pre, pre uh, preschool age. By the way, of, of all of you that are here, a show of hands, how many of you are here and? Uh, 2009 when we first arrived on this scene. Wow, quite a few. Um, so glad to be back here. And for those of the rest of you who do not know us, um, it'd be nice to get to know you a little bit too. So please introduce us uh, yourself to us later on. And we'd like to see your face. So if you can pull the mask down just even briefly. <laughs> so um, I... Along with our scrapbook, we also have, we brought with us as part of it actually is our Korean English dictionary, which we didn't use a lot, but we still have that too. We were reminded, or at least I was reminded of um, you when I heard this song on the radio. It's quite an old one um, from back in the 80s. And it's by uh, one of the composers is Carol Cimbala. She was the wife of Jim Cimbala, who was pastor of, of, of the Brooklyn Tabernacle Church that got a restart under him. It, he was going there to close the church and ended up building one of the most, uh, one of the larger ministries in the New York area, if not in the United States. And she wrote a song called Praise You, and it starts this way. Lord, I come to you today with a simple prayer to pray, and everything I do, let my life, O oh Lord, praise you. I think that fits you very well as a congregation. You are always intent on praising God and loving Jesus, following the Holy Spirit. I just uh, admire you so much. And so I would like to leave you with a blessing that uh, I'm a little bit out of practice, so I have to read these things now. I haven't been in a pulpit for a while. So, New Hope Church, you are the disciples of Jesus Christ. Live in love as Christ loved us 
and gave himself for us. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Amen. And a prayer for you. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will continue to watch over these, our friends, our church of time past, and we have hardly much time at all go by, but you don't remind us of our experience here and of the love we all shared. And as I said before, I feel very emotional right at this moment. And uh, just being back here, um, experiencing uh, this worship service with them and to be numbered among one of them as brothers and sisters in Christ. May we all uh, relish in that certain knowledge that you are our Father in heaven, just as Jesus asked us to call you. And we pray this in the name of our beloved Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, okay. Thank you. Yep. Pastor Sam and, and Judy, just please accept this uh, small, very small gift as a token of our appreciation for your faithfulness and leadership and guidance and, and patience with um, New Hope Church uh, during the formative years. Um, yeah, that was what's a, that? That had to be two ways. Two way street. <laughs> two way street. That, that's true. Thank you. Yes. And of course, uh, you know, those were um, important times. And I'd like to think, and I do think, that God certainly used you uh, to help build the foundation for New Hope Church. And we're still the beneficiaries of that. So thank you very much. Follow along as I read today's scripture reading from Jeremiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 6, and this is from the NLT. The Lord gave a message to Jeremiah after Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had released him at Ramah. He had found Jeremiah bound in chains among all the other captives of Jerusalem and Judah who were being sent to exile in Babylon. The captain of the guard called for Jeremiah and said, The Lord your God has brought this disaster on his land just as he said he would, for these people have sinned against the Lord and disobeyed him. That is why it happened. But I am going to take off your chains and let you go. If you don't want to come with me to Babylon, you are welcome. I will see that you are well cared for. But if you don't want to come, you may stay here. The whole land is before you. Go wherever you like. If you decide to stay, then return to Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, and grandson of Zephan. He has been appointed governor of Judah by the king of Babylon. Stay there with the people he, he rules, but it's up to you. Go wherever you like. Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, gave Jeremiah some food and money and let him go. So Jeremiah returned to Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, at Mizpah, and he lived in Judah with the few who were still left in the land. This was the word of God. When life is hard, we tend to wonder, what if? What if I chose a different city or a different company? What if I chose a different major or a different career? And of course, we sometimes wonder, what if I spent more time with this person instead of that? There are a lot of movies that play on this idea. In Sliding Doors, the movie begins with Gwyneth Paltrow rushing to catch a train, and the sliding doors are closing. And the movie shows what would have happened if she made it through the sliding doors. And it also shows you what would have happened if the sliding doors closed on her. What if is the dominant theme in that movie. And even when the movie is about something else, raising the question of what if is a way of bringing depth to the minor characters. In the movie Margin Call, we have a movie that explains how the 2008 financial crisis started. But two of the smartest guys in the movie, the ones who figured out the housing bubble was about to burst, they both wonder throughout the movie, what if I did something else with my life? Eric Dale was a civil engineer in Ohio who left his career to become a risk analyst for an investment bank. But after getting fired from the firm in his early 50s, he's left with a multi-million dollar home that he can no longer afford, and he regrets the old life that he left behind. 
He remembers a bridge that he designed in his younger days, a bridge that is still standing and is saving commuters time, fulfilling a function in society to this day. He thinks about the value that he could have added to other people's lives if he stayed in engineering, and he regrets deeply having dedicated his best years to providing risk analysis for an investment bank that would go on to destroy the life savings of millions of people. But that same movie presents a counterpoint through a guy in his later 20s, Peter Sullivan, who was a new risk analyst on Eric's team. Peter, before joining the firm, was an engineer too, and the crisis makes him wonder, do I have blood on my hands? Engineering seems to be an easier way to have a satisfying life, but in the end, Peter decides that it's important to have a seat at the table to try to help build a more responsible culture for the investment bank from the inside. So right at the end of the movie, he and Eric exchange a glance and have a meaningful moment. And it shows that two well-meaning individuals who are both brilliant and well-meaning can end up disagreeing and yet respect each other. I, re I appreciate how the movie takes the question, what if I chose a different career? And it leaves us the audience with no simple resolution. I wonder, have you ever wondered about switching careers? Have you wanted to go back in time, and change a decision that you made in your past? That is a universal human desire, and we feel it most when life is hardest. It's a feeling that I think Jeremiah, he understood very well. There are many times that Jeremiah is in a tough spot, and he thinks, if only my life was different, if only God had picked someone else to be the prophet, if only I had a different job. He was misunderstood by his family, contradicted by priests and prophets. He was imprisoned by the king, called a traitor by the people. Jeremiah's life was sad and full of loss, and he's known to us as the weeping prophet. And throughout his life, the most common theme in Jeremiah's prayers is the question, what the heck, God? And I wonder, have you ever prayed that way? What the heck, God? Have you ever expressed indignation when underneath what you really meant to communicate was regret? Our hearts muttering, God, if I could do this all over again, I would not want to obey you. God, I regret following you, and I wish that you had just left me alone. Throughout his life, Jeremiah regrets following God. His prayers are full of regret at following God. Chapter 11 shows us that when Jeremiah is trying to obey God, evil men are plotting against him. When you do something hard because it's the right thing to do, you hope that people will honor you. You don't demand it, but you hope others will come alongside you, encourage you, help, and bless you. It would make me sad if my efforts went unnoticed. And don't you get frustrated when people take you for granted. But imagine being Jeremiah. How would you feel if you went above and beyond the call of duty? You did the right thing, and people responded, not by ignoring you, but by punishing you. They go out of their way to plot against you. Being ignored while doing good is frustrating, but being punished for doing good, now that is infuriating. It makes you say, God, what the heck? Jeremiah, he feels betrayed by God, and in chapter 12, he starts praying, God, why do you let the wicked people prosper? Those people who are out to get me, you know that they're being evil, and they're getting promotions, they're getting honors. Meanwhile, I am trying to please you, and I am suffering. What is going on? When he prayed this way, I think Jeremiah half expected that God would apologize. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeremiah, I didn't realize this was going on, my bad. But that's not what he gets. God responds to Jeremiah's complaint by asking him, why are you complaining about your training? If you can't keep up when I have you running against people, how are you going to keep up when I have you running against horses? If being plotted against by your enemies is so hard for you, how are you going to make it when you're being betrayed by your friends and family members? God's response to Jeremiah in chapter 12 is, I know it's hard, but this is all a part of the training. This is what makes you fit for the important work that I've chosen you to do. And after God's response, the funny thing is Jeremiah is convinced. He's like, okay, fine. If this work is so important and you need someone so special to do it, okay, fine, I'll go along for the training. 
he submits to God's discipline and he becomes stronger. And then years go by and we get to Jeremiah chapter 20. And at this point, Jeremiah is prophesying when a guy named Pashpur, who's a priest, he comes and strikes him. I want you to imagine this. It's like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is leading a protest and speaking um, the words that God has on his heart and a coalition of pastors criticize him for disturbing the peace and approve of the police locking him up. But whereas Dr. King goes on to write calmly letters from a Birmingham jail, Jeremiah, he, he just breaks. He is so angry. Jeremiah, when confronted by the priest, he is then beaten and then put in stocks. Stocks are like a wooden trap where your head goes in and your hands go in and you're locked in. People walking by would insult him and they would throw dirt and worse at him. I try to imagine how much your back would hurt after a couple of hours in the stocks. Imagine how impossible it would be to sleep while you are locked into the stocks. Imagine the shame of needing to go to the bathroom while you're stuck in the stocks. The stocks are pretty hard to endure. And the experience messed up Jeremiah pretty bad. And we can tell by how Jeremiah prays after he is released. Jeremiah is at this point furious with God. God, you tricked me. You pressured me. I didn't want to be a prophet, but you made me do it. And look how miserable you made me. Whenever I share the message you give me, people just mock and hate me. Jeremiah goes on to pray in chapter 20. Because it's so hard, I didn't want to do it anymore. I closed my mouth. I resolved never to prophesy again. But when I said I wouldn't share, you wouldn't leave me alone. Not speaking your word made me feel like there was fire shut up in my bones. Not speaking your message made me feel like a volcano about to erupt. You made it so that I'm mocked if I share and I'm miserable if I don't. I'm punished by people if I prophesy. And I'm punished by you if I don't. It's just not fair. And Jeremiah ends his prayer in the following way. I wish I was never born. Since you made obeying you so hard, and since you made disobeying you even harder, I would rather not exist. Cursed be the day that I was born. It would have been better if someone killed me while I was a baby. He says these things. It's not a rated G prayer. I don't think this is even a PG-13 prayer. Jeremiah is getting vulgar, disrespectful, and nihilistic as he's complaining to God. I hate my life. I just hate it. So even after going through all of the training that God provided, Jeremiah still said, this is too hard. I hate my life. But his life goes on. The book of Jeremiah doesn't end with chapter 20. His life keeps going, and we see one adventure after another. Chapter by chapter, Jeremiah lives a James Bond type life. Um, he's called a traitor. He's put in prison. He's hated by crowds. He's hunted by kings. But he's not a Pierce Brosnan type of James Bond who emerges from crisis unscathed and has a witty joke at the end. Jeremiah is a Daniel Craig type of James Bond who gets bruised and broken, whose mind and body become damaged goods. Jeremiah builds up experience and matures as God's agent, but it certainly costs him. By the time we get to chapter 40, today's passage, Jeremiah is hurt and he's limping. He's physically malnourished and most of his friends are dead or in hiding. But finally, by chapter 40, the doom that Jeremiah has been prophesying about for decades finally comes to pass. Babylon has conquered Jerusalem. But even when God brings about the judgment, and even when God proves that Jeremiah was right all along, Jeremiah's situation does not immediately improve. Let's look then at verse 1 of today's passage. The Lord gave a message to Jeremiah the, after Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had released him at Ramah. He had found Jeremiah bound in chains among all the other captives of Jerusalem and Judah who were being sent to exile in Babylon. I want you to notice what condition Jeremiah is in. He is bound in chains along with all of the other captives. All of the other captives who are guilty of rebellion against God, they deserve to be in chains. But Jeremiah is in chains too, just like them. Even though he's been loyal to God, he was not treated any differently. 
This is a reason to be upset with God. Jeremiah could have prayed, what the heck, God? Why do I have to be chained with all of these others? Don't you know what I deserve? But at this point in his life, that is not the attitude that we see. Although he is physically and socially weak, Jeremiah is spiritually strong in chapter 40. Instead of complaining to God and regretting his call and pitying himself, Jeremiah trusts God. He stays faithful to his call and he counts himself blessed which is revealed by the choice that he makes. Nebuzaradan, the Babylonian general, he offers to take Jeremiah to Babylon as his honored guest. Jeremiah can go to the biggest and richest city in the world and live in comfort and luxury as the guest of a victorious general. Nebuzaradan offers Jeremiah a reward, and he probably expected Jeremiah to be eager to take it. Come on, Jeremiah. The people here, they still hold grudges against you. The economy of Jerusalem will take generations to recover. In the short run, there is risk of famine and violence. And if you decide to stay, I'll give you some money and some food and tell Gedaliah, the Jewish governor, to protect you. But once we go, I can't guarantee your safety. You should forget this place. You deserve better than this. Retire in Babylon in comfort and safety. God knows you've earned it. Nebuzaradan is offering Jeremiah the words that are soothing his soul. It's everything that he ever wanted. And Nebuzaradan says, it's up to you. You can go wherever you like. Imagine if you had that choice. Comfort, luxury, and honor in Babylon. Opportunities to perhaps study and learn from the brightest minds. A chance to influence the most powerful people. Or you can have hardship, suffering, and your enemies in Jerusalem, where the possibility of assassination is high, as well as the possibility of starvation. What city would you choose? Babylon? Jerusalem? And the remarkable thing is that Jeremiah chooses Jerusalem. Why does he do it? It's not absolutely clear in the text, but notice that verse 1 says, that God gave Jeremiah a message after his brief talk with Nebuzaradan. We're not told the content of that message from God, but based on Jeremiah's choice, I assume that God was telling Jeremiah, I want you to stay and serve me here in Battlescar, Jerusalem. This time, God doesn't overpower Jeremiah or force him to obey. Instead, we see Jeremiah, and at this point, he is freely faithful. He has to choose between the call of God and what seems like the opportunity of a lifetime from Nebuzaradan, but Jeremiah freely chooses to be faithful to God. And so Jeremiah chapter 40, it helps us understand the goal of God in discipling Jeremiah. In particular, Jeremiah chapter 20 is very depressing unless you know what's coming in Jeremiah chapter 40. In Jeremiah chapter 20, the prophet says, I hate my life because I'm miserable whether I choose to serve God or run away from God. It seems like God is cruel and he forces us to do things that we don't want to do. But that is only for a time. God takes us through the days where we say, I would rather be dead because that's how he prepares us to have the faith to proclaim that your presence is better than life. By chapter 40, the training has done its work. Jeremiah can look at all of the attractive and beautiful things that Babylon offers and says, no thanks, I would rather embrace the hardships that come with the life of serving God. And the reason God takes us through Jeremiah chapter 20 is so that we can experience the life of Jeremiah chapter 40. I'm not sure what chapter you are in your relationship with God. Maybe you're a Jeremiah chapter 12 kind of Christian. Your prayers are full of, what the heck, God? Why do the people who ignore you get easier and better lives than me? Why aren't you taking my side? Or maybe you've grown to the point of being a Jeremiah 20 type Christian where you've suffered even more. And you say, fine, I'll obey you. But it's only because you punish me so much when I disobey you. I'm choosing to follow you because I don't have any real choice in the matter. Maybe you're not proud of your faith right now. 
maybe you see yourself as limping and barely making it. But the promise of Jeremiah chapter 40 is that one day, through completing the training that God has for you, you will become a freely faithful Christian. Like Jeremiah, you will trust that wherever God wants you to be is for you the best place on earth. Then you won't need to be bribed or scolded by God to be faithful. Your faithfulness will be truly free. And that, that's when your influence will be truly powerful. Jeremiah choosing to stay in Jerusalem probably motivated Daniel not to get too comfortable in Babylon. Remember, Babylon... Uh, training corps. And Daniel at this time was one of the top officials of the Babylonian Empire. But imagine him hearing that Jeremiah has the opportunity to come and join him in Babylon, but instead Jeremiah chooses to remain in Jerusalem. That probably did a lot to keep Daniel humble. It helped him to be praying for Jerusalem instead of getting distracted by the parties and luxuries of Babylon. In the same way, Jeremiah's example probably helped Nehemiah make the tough decisions to give up his high position as cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. He was able to find the motivation to go and rebuild Jerusalem, partly because of the example of Jeremiah before him. I'm not sure if you know some people who are choosing to be in hard places for God's sake. I'm fairly proud of the one semester I spent in Cambodia because it was so hot and so hard when I was there. And there was a missionary who was in charge of me, who was my mentor, and he's still there in Cambodia. Any time that I think about just taking it easy, I look at his Facebook post where he's continuing to disciple the people that we were working with 15 years ago. And he's still enduring the, the sweat-drenching climate that is Cambodia and sowing seeds in a place where there's so much opposition. Whenever I see him, uh, his wife and his daughter Grace, um, I am forced to remember that there are people who are influencing my life. And it keeps me more honest. It keeps me more prayerful. If you keep reading about Jeremiah in the October issue of Living Life, complimentary copies right at that table, You'll see that Gedaliah and others in Jerusalem that he's, you know, partnering with, they refuse to listen to him. It doesn't end happily ever after. He ends up getting kidnapped and abused as the rebels continue to rebuild against God's will. However, their mistreatment of him does not make Jeremiah sullen. He does not pray self-pitying prayers anymore. Instead, you see his prophetic imagination begin to be stretched to the fullest by the majesty of God. In the earlier chapters, Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet, but in the latter chapters, Jeremiah becomes what I call a booming prophet. His spoken word prophecies are like cannons fired against fortified cities. He is fearless. His words are full of boldness. Jeremiah is fully confident that the Lord Almighty reigns on both heaven and earth, and he calls all kings to bow down in reverence before the only true God, calls every empire to repentance. There is such a change of tone and language between the early and latter chapters of Jeremiah that some scholars argue that the latter chapters were actually written by another person who was writing in Jeremiah's name. However, if you consider the character development that takes place gradually throughout the life of Jeremiah, you can see that there is an integrity between chapters 1 all the way to 52. It's the same person, but he sounds so different because of a lifetime of being trained by God. Jeremiah is like a caterpillar that turns into a butterfly. And chapter 40 is him emerging from the cocoon. And the final chapters are him spreading his wings to fly. You can study those chapters again in the complimentary copies of Living Life right over there. All you got to do is pick it up and then open it up. And then you will see the boldness of this once weeping prophet who has found true confidence in God. Honestly, the... Um, prophetic judgments against all the empires, it was very hard for me to appreciate them the first 30 times I read them. 
But these days, as I'm reading the prophecies against Edom and the Moabites and Babylon and all the other countries, I'm thinking, man, God took this guy on such a journey and transformed him so that this self-pitying man becomes someone who is so bold about what God will do. He is convinced about the sovereign rule of God. Let's be encouraged by Jeremiah's freely faithful example. In the past, we could not help feeling jealous of the cheaters who prospered and the wicked who got their way. There were days when we hated our life. But let's believe that when our spiritual training ends, it will make us freely faithful. In the same way that those who complained about piano lessons are now actually grateful that they were taught piano, that those who are shown tough love are grateful to be recovering addicts. Let's trust God's discipleship process. God is in the process of shaping us to be people who are freely faithful in two ways. First, God teaches us that terrible things are actually not that terrible when you have God with you. And second, God shows us that great things are not that great when God is not with you. Jeremiah learns that the presence of God is everything to him. He learns how to be content in both abundance and need because he knows that it is God's presence that strengthens him. This is, of course, the same lesson that the Apostle Paul and all the other spiritual giants in the Bible learn. In his life, we can see both lessons play out in great detail. First, God teaches Jeremiah not to fear the trouble by taking him through it. What is the best way to get your child to not be afraid of roller coasters? It's to make him go on a roller coaster. You ride it together. Then the kid feels that even though he felt like he was going to fall out of his seat and die, he discovers that the safety gear really holds him in place. How do you get the kid to overcome the fear of angry crowds of powerful people? It's to tell your kids you got their back and make them go and speak to those crowds. I'm sure Jeremiah's knees and his voice were trembling, but he discovered that God kept him from falling and held him steady. God trains Jeremiah not to fear beatdowns by having him endure beatdowns. He teaches him not to fear imprisonment by having him endure imprisonment, hunger. He puts him in it and then he carries him through it. Even though Satan has power to give him pain, Jeremiah discovers that Satan doesn't have the power to take away God's comfort. Bent over in the stocks or sinking into a pit of cold clay, Jeremiah was forced to look at despair and death in the face many times. But he learned that if you're standing where God has called you to be, even when you're staring into death, faith gives you the ability to see through death to see the God of comfort who is with you still. God puts us through scary, embarrassing, and difficult situations, and sometimes we accuse God of being a sadistic bully. What the heck, God? Are you like a little boy with a magnifying glass burning ants? Do you take delight in my torment? But in time, we see that God is like an artist that molds and fires a piece of clay to create a masterpiece. God is a staff sergeant who loves to see soldiers become fearless. He's a trainer that loves to see us leave behind our weakness. God puts us through terrible situations so that we learn that with God, it's not that bad. So as John Piper would put it, don't waste your cancer. Don't waste the pandemic. Don't waste the terrible moments of your life. Let that trouble teach you that with God at your side, nothing can shake you. The presence of pain does not take away God's comfort. But God's training program is not just a school of hard knocks. The second thing Jeremiah learns is that awesome things are not that awesome if you don't have God. To teach this lesson, God gives Jeremiah moments of popularity and honor. In the early days of the king Zedekiah of Judah, Jeremiah was popular. He was sought after. In chapter 37, the king asks him, please pray to the Lord for us. He's given freedom. He's given honor. Jeremiah gets wined and dined by the royals who want him to get God on their side. God gives Jeremiah enough of a taste of the good life to know that it's not that great. 
God brings Jeremiah to the rich and famous to show him that their character is shameless so that he would so that he knows that he would rather be blameless even if it means becoming poor and nameless Jeremiah is able to say no to Nebuzaradan because by chapter 40 he's already seen that the good life doesn't always make people good he's seen that the privileged and powerful act in petty and childish ways maybe this will encourage you to help you understand why God at one point in your life may have had you sit with the popular kids or had you wined and dined by powerful people at certain points of your life. God was not giving you a good thing and taking it away. God was showing you that the so-called privileged around you are haunted by the fear of losing what they have, even when they don't know how to use it well. God wants you to spend enough time with them so that you can learn to pity them have compassion on them. God wants you to see that they, like you, need only one true treasure that is offered in this world. Faith in Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave us life for us. We are learning that without God, no good thing can satisfy us. We are also learning that with God, no bad thing can shake us. These lessons together make us freely faithful and as we do so and as we mature in our faith we will no longer waste our time wondering what if we wonder what if when we're afraid of our troubles or jealous of other people's comforts we wonder man what if in escapist and disloyal ways when we are spiritually immature we are forced to wonder, what if, when we willfully disobey the commandment of God, but when we learn to be freely faithful, instead of asking what if, we begin to ask, what now? When we face troubles, we ask, God, what now? What shall I do now? How can I depend on you? What can I do now to endure this trouble in a way that glorifies you? What now, O oh God? In the same way, if you're given great opportunities, we also ask, what now? What do you want me to understand about the world and the people around me? What can I do now to leverage these gifts for your glory? It took decades of walking with God for Jeremiah to learn these lessons. And all of us, we haven't internalized these lessons fully yet. We're going to be inconsistent. But every time we fail, we have to remember to draw close to Jesus because when I remember Jesus, then I remember and I realize I don't need money or power or respect that this world offers. I don't need attention or approval of any person or group. I can say with boldness when I remember Jesus that all I need is him. May that be our testimony as God takes us on our journey to make us freely faithful. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you that you care more about us becoming strong than us approving of you. We thank you that you're more loyal to completing the work begun in us than winning our approval. We thank you that you hold us to your standard and you insist on making us completely, freely faithful when we are hurting, when we can't see why, when we're filled with regret, help us to experience the presence of Jesus Christ so that we can say yes to your plan, trust the process, and believe that you will make us what you say you want us to be, an inspiration to this world, a testimony of your great faithfulness. These things we pray in Christ's name. We will now have a brief time of offering. Um, there are, uh, there's a wooden offering thing in the back uh, with envelopes. So if you would like to um, give offering that way, uh, you can do it at your leisure, uh, before or after service. I mean, after service now, I guess. Um, and we also have a My Well Giving app. So if you guys can um, give through that, I'm sure that God would be pleased. Um, thank you.
Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together today to worship and praise you. Although it has been difficult to worship together these past few months, let us to stay optimistic and keep looking forward to being together again in and out of church. Lord, please help, please help KPCMD, the pastors, and the elders prepare and plan for future in-person worship once it becomes safe to do so. Lord, please help those in need during these difficult times, those who are sick, those facing unemployment, those who have financial troubles, those in despair or maybe enraged from recent events, and those who seek healing. Lord, we pray for those who may have become lazy or lost their way in their faith due to COVID and social distancing. May the reopenings and lifted restrictions allow followers to come back to the church and seek you. Although this year has been unpredictable, strange, and a little chaotic, may we not forget that you are everlasting and that all things are possible through you. Please help us to not lose sight of your love and that even during what may seem like the worst of times, that you still love us and watch over us. Thank you for Pastor Sam's sermons and his messages to help us cope during these difficult times, and we thank him for his efforts to bring us back together for in-person worship. Please watch over those who are not able to join us today and that they may join us next week. Help us to love others the way you have loved us and to be faithful disciples who spread your word. And we give thanks for all your blessings, your love, our health, and our loved ones. Amen. We will now have a time of announcements. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for joining uh, for those that are online. We have a few announcements. We will be having an outdoor worship service until October 11th. So for the next two Sundays, it will be at 11 a.m. Um, we, will, we do temperature checks for all worshipers as they arrive to church. And uh, we will have individually plated snacks for each week. There will also be a live stream for those who prefer to worship at home. We have prayer meetings every Saturday morning at 9.30 a.m. So if you uh, find yourself having a little uh, hard time praying by yourself, I encourage you to come out. If Even if you uh, pray every single day, I encourage you guys to come out and encourage those who uh, are praying for our church and uh, our world. 9.30 a.m. and the Zoom link is provided uh, in your bulletin. We have Club Jubilee at 11 every Saturday. Um, if you have a child between first and fifth grade, I encourage you to encourage your child to uh, join Club Jubilee and learn more about God and grow closer in community with other children in our church. Cl cults and Heresies, uh, we will have a seminar uh, on Wednesdays at 7.30 on October 15th, 22nd, and 29th. So if you want to learn a little bit more about cults and heresies, I encourage you guys to uh, join. It'll be uh, online, and so pretty safe. Um, and last but not least, there is one-to-one -one graduation. Let's uh, give a hand to Chung Soo Kim, who uh, completed one-to-one -one discipleship. Woo! And this, if anyone else is interested in growing deeper in their faith, um, getting a better foundation for what it means to be Christian, and, and especially a Christian at New Hope Church, we encourage you guys to uh, email um, Elder John at jungwoomd at yahoo.com. And if you are curious about counseling or want to receive counseling, our church provides a professional counselor, uh, Chris Yu, and his email is provided in the bulletin as well. Thank you guys for coming today. Thank you. Let's all stand.
tomorrow will bring But I know here in the middle Is the place where you promised to be Will you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? As I walk now through the valley. Your love rise above every fear Like the sun shaping the shadow In my weakness your glory you come Will you meet me here again Cause all I want Is all you are Will you meet me here again Say it again I'm not enough Unless you come, will you meet me here again? Cause all I want, cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? For a minute Was I forsaken The Lord is in this place The Lord is in this place Come Holy Spirit Dry bones awaken The Lord is in this place The Lord is in the scene again not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Come, Holy Spirit, bones awaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. you come will you meet me here again cause all I want is all you are will you meet me here again sing not for not for a minute was I forsaken is in this place the Lord is in this place come Holy Spirit dry bones awaken the Lord is in this place the Lord is in this place I'm not enough unless you come All I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? See, I'm not. I'm not enough unless you come.
call Will you meet me here again Cause all I want Is all you are As we're singing, I sense God's response. Yes, I am here. Yes, I am here for you, to strengthen you and to be with you. But he's asking us to focus and to receive this moment with intentionality and the readiness to partner with them. God challenges us when we are feeling crushed by the hardships that are on our shoulders. He's asking us to trust that he's put that load on to train us and to make us stronger. And he's saying, if you will go into it with a heart that believes that you can, because I am holding you, I am upholding you, I am with you, and if you will believe in me, you can do this and it will make you stronger. He's challenging us to believe. He's also challenging us to awaken and know that the reason why we have the comforts and honors around us is not so that we can grow in our sense of entitlement and pride, but so we can develop a heart of compassion for those that other people are jealous of. So that we can resolve that truly the only good thing, the only true treasure in this life is to know Christ and to make him known. God is in this place and he asks us, will you trust that I'm here and respond to every challenge and respond to every honor with belief that I am training you and needing you? God, may it be that your people are aware of your leadership and may it be that we respond alertly and faithfully to the situations that you put us in believing that your strong blessing is upholding us may the love of god the father the grace that is in christ jesus and the fellowship of the holy spirit be upon all who choose to trust in his name in jesus name we pray amen amen thank you for joining us in worship in the back we'll have uh, apple cider and